Hello, welcome. Thank you to everyone who's watching and taking time to be here today for you and your health. I'm Katherine Miller, Holistic Health and Energy Coach, Menopause Guide, and the host of this Healthy Habit Change Summit. I'm here today with our keynote speaker, Linda Fogg Phillips, director of the Tiny Habits Academy, and also the author of two books out in the fall, Habits for Health and Tiny Habits for Moms. So hi, Linda, thank you so much for being here today. Hey, thank you, Catherine. I, it's just an honor to be a part of your summit and to be here uh, with you. So thank you so much. Wonderful. Gosh, I'm so excited to dig into the secrets and the science behind behavior and habit change with you. And since this is the very first interview everyone will be watching, I want to set a little context um, for, for our viewers. First of all, if you've tried to change your lifestyle habits or tried to get rid of a bad habit and start a new one, uh, or had like, and, and then found out it's very difficult or you've had limited success, or maybe you've even failed. This is the most important interview for you to watch. If you only watch one interview for the whole summit, let it be this one. Linda's work focuses on behavior change and habit design, and you will experience a completely new relationship to habit change by the end of this interview. So secondly, or at least a completely new potential. <laughs> secondly, <laughs> I designed this summit because of my own frustrations. I've hosted three successful summits before this one. I've spoken on many more, and of course, I've attended dozens. And although I always find the information incredibly invaluable and the generosity of the speakers incredibly amazing, I've never really felt like I or the other participants attending uh, changed in the way that I hoped or expected. So, and as a health coach, people actually changing and getting results, that's the reason I do everything. So to me, the information is only as good as your ability to act on it and get results. So also, you're probably coming overwhelmed or hurting or looking for some kind of relief. And I don't want you leaving feeling even more overwhelmed, confused, sometimes even guilty that you couldn't follow through on the information you've been given. So that's why I decided to do something different and plan the summit around habit change. We have just spe three speakers each week. They're available for four days for listening. Each speaker will give you one tiny action step to focus on and build into a habit of your own. And my goal is that right now with Linda's help, you'll learn this simple, easy way of making new habits. Then you can apply it through all the summit and in all the different ways you want to create change in your life. So, all right, we're ready to dig in. So I'm going to start with just a little sort of tiny uh, bio for you, Linda. Um, we understand your work focuses on behavior change and habit design, but I also found out that you're the mother of eight children and that um, that has basically been one of your laboratories for behavior change and habit design for like 32 years. Um, also, yep. you, have <laughs> you also have a master's degree in health promotion and exercise physiology. I want everyone to know that. And you spent over 30 years studying these different health behaviors like nutrition, fitness, mental health. So you definitely come not only with, with letters and things after your name, but actually, you know, life hands-on life experience. Okay. So now we need to <laughs> find out all about that. <laughs> yes. And, and the eight children are also by design, I guess you could say, when you talk about, you know, habits by design and, and behavior design, I did, I wanted a large family. I actually wanted 10. Didn't quite oh, get Oh, wow. Um, but yeah, my, I've learned everything I know from, from my kids as well as from my brother, BJ Fogg, who is the creator of the tiny habits method. And uh, the tiny habits, my, my mission in life is to help people, basically to help them reinstill hope and evidence that they can make changes in their life. Uh, but you know, as, as we grow older and as we experience more life, sometimes we get very discouraged because we fail at mm -hmm. creating the lifestyle or doing the behaviors or the habits that we want to. And it's not really our fault. It's simply that we haven't been taught the proper, proper approach to creating habits that are sustainable. Mm -hmm without relying on motivation or willpower. Now that might surprise you, but we use a lot of analogies in the tiny habits method, you know, a lot of plant analogies and all habits start as a little tiny seed. And so that's, uh, that's where the tiny habits method is coming from. And we will get into depth with that method today to the point where our listeners 
will be able to immediately implement the tiny habits method into their life in whatever aspect or in, in whatever area of their life that they're interested in doing so. So, um, so and I know Catherine, I, I mentioned to you earlier, um, you know, how I got into this and, and why I got into this, of course, BJ Fogg is my brother. Um, he's brilliant. He's a behavioral scientist at Stanford University. We worked together in some capacity professionally for the last 10 years. Initially in working with him, I was working um, in the field of online behavior. Actually was a consultant for Facebook for many years as a result of that. And then, um, you know, I transitioned as tiny habits as that method was developed and as it, yes. the scientifically proven method. And as BJ started to see the impact of this method in the world and how it changes people's lives, then he gave me the opportunity to build this out as a training for people, for professionals. We have a professional training for coaches and also for individuals that want to really be successful in creating new habits and behaviors in their life. So he gave me the opportunity to do that. Um, I know that tiny habits changes lives. In fact, in my life, I can very easily say with validity that it has saved my life. Now, that's a pretty bold statement, but let me tell you why I say that. Ten years ago, well, like Catherine said, I have eight kids. Um, they're wonderful kids. Ten years ago, um, my 20-year-old son unfortunately overdosed with an, oh. an accidental Oxycontin overdose. Great kid, straight A student, athlete, Eagle Scout. It was a situation that um, unfortunately he got into and could not kick the habit of abusing Oxycontin. And unfortunately oh. it did take his life. Um, that devastated my family, as you can imagine. It's still, in fact, we're coming up on the anniversary of Garrett's death, which is a day that we all commemorate as a family because it changed our lives, but we also want to celebrate him. But as you can imagine, that devastated myself, my husband, and my children. Um, in, in shortly after Garrett's death, I became very apathetic, became very depressed. I didn't want to get out of bed. Um, you know, we've all been in situations that have caused us to feel like that at some point or another. And I was really struggling to function. Um, in fact, a year after that, I, I simply, you know, I had other children to care for, but I really just wanted to check out of life because it was too painful for me. A year after that, I had a really serious horse accident. We lived on a five acre horse ranch, my dream home. I love animals, love horses. Um, I had a very serious horse accident that should have killed me. Uh, however, instead of killing me, it gave me the opportunity to wake up. And when I say that, what I mean is I was unconscious, I stopped breathing, I was life flighted to our trauma hospital. When I regained consciousness the next day, I had a very clear voice in my head. The very first thing that I heard was this phrase, your life has just been saved and you better damn well figure out why. Those the exact words. It's like, what? Um, wow. So as I've continue to figure out, okay, why am I still here? Yeah, I know I have responsibilities towards my children, but it, and my children are my, you know, my life. Um, as many of us that have children know that, you know, they, everything centers around our children and their welfare, even as they grow into adulthood. Um, but as I've gone along this journey since that point in time, I've realized that my purpose is to take this message out into the world to help people regain the hope and evidence that they can change. Mm -hmm. So as we go on past that um, horse accident, things didn't get much better for me and my family. I have a daughter that's extremely bipolar. And during 2000, 2000, from 2010 to 2012, she was in out of the hospital and she was uh, committed to a psych ward twice during those two years, in and out of the hospital multiple times. And that was a really stressful situation. On the tail end of that, or in the midst of all, all that, I guess I should say, um, we had a family home building business. We live in Las Vegas and we had done quite well for 25 years. Um, the business employed my sons, my son-in-laws, my brother. You know, it was a very tight-knit, successful home building business. But as you're aware, with the economy through 2008 to 2012, it took our business out of the game. Mm. We had to file bankruptcy. We could not, we had to lay off, um, you know, our employees, our family members. Uh, we couldn't make payments on our ranch. Um, it, it got really difficult and really dicey. Um, so here in the midst of this, we were losing everything. You know, I, I'd lost my son. I'd nearly lost my life. I was struggling with my daughter who, you know, I felt like I was losing her as well. Now we've lost our, our home, our horse ranch, because we had to walk away from it. We had to close wow. the doors to our family business. And at that point in time, this was also about the time that Tiny Habits started to 
be proven as a very successful scientific method in helping people create change. Um, about that point in time, I realized that it was my responsibility to support my family because my husband, for some reason, was not making good decisions and I could not figure out why. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, he, brilliant man, very successful businessman, and all of a sudden he was making really unexplainable decisions that were negatively impactful on our financial standing and on our family. Um, so I, I realized, okay, I need to help bridge this gap. Maybe he's stressed, maybe he's depressed with what's going on with the economy. You know, I felt like this is just for a short period of time because up until that point in time, primarily my focus was raising my kids. Well, we got through, you know, um, so I started, this is where I started working with BJ. And this is also where tiny habits during this course started to really surface as an effective method. Um, BJ and I are very, very close and he knows my struggles and he knew how I was really just struggling to get up into you know, during the day and even put one foot in front of the other, even though I knew I still had a purpose to be alive. I just didn't know exactly what it was at that point. And as I started working in with, with him on tiny habits, he said, Linda, why don't you try this tiny habit that we call the Maui habit? Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, I have nothing to lose by doing that. Mm -hmm. So the Maui habit is this. After I put my feet on the floor in the morning, I'll say it's going to be a great day and celebrate. You know, I celebrate that. Um, so I thought, okay, well, this is maybe a strange habit, but yeah, I, I trust BJ. He's brilliant. You know, he's a world expert in the field of habit formation and behavior change. So it's like, okay. So I started practicing that habit of after my feet hit the floor in the morning, I'll say it's going to be a great day. And then I celebrated in some manner. Um, what I found happened is by practicing that habit, it changed my perspective. It changed mm -hmm. the way I approached my day. Yes, I had hard days ahead of me and I knew that. And some days when I get up and say, it's going to be a great day, I thought, oh, well, that's not going to happen. So I started changing that saying to say, it's going to be a great day somehow, or I'm going to make it a great day for someone else. Um, so what I did there is I changed my perspective from that of a victim to a victor. I started my day out with a win. Then I started bookmarking my book, ending my day by the tiny habit of after my head hits the pillow at night, I will think of one thing that I'm grateful for. So I started my day with a win. I ended my day with a win. And that completely changed my mindset and changed the way I approached my day. It also changed the way that I interacted with my family members and loved ones as well. So that was a very transformative habit for me. And we've had millions, well, I should, no, not millions, tens of thousands of people that have also, we will have millions at some point in time. <laughs> we've had tens of thousands of people that have also practiced that tiny habit, habit and have reported it has also transformed their life and basically how they, how they function on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm. So I'm going to challenge your listeners to try that habit. But as we went along, so I started, I practiced that habit and it did change my mindset and gave me the emotional, mental, and physical strength to face my challenges. My challenges didn't stop there. As I mentioned, my husband was in a position where he wasn't making, I was noticing he wasn't making good decisions, which was unlike him. So I convinced him to go to a neurologist. At the neurology visit, this was in 2014, he was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's disease at the age of 58. At that oh point God. in time, I knew that I was even on a, I was, I was continuing on this path of challenge that was not going to get any easier for me as I went forward. And this is where tiny habits really have become an anchor for me in my life. It's given me that strength. Um, my husband, uh, he's now 64. He is in the later stages of Alzheimer's disease. He is living in a memory care center because he's at the point he's, he's in the later stages so that I can no longer care for him safely here at home. Yeah. We know we're going to lose him probably within the next 12 months. It's not going to be you know, very far out. However, I know that my family and I have the strength to weather that challenge as well because we know how to create positivity around us. We know how to create a mindset that's a winning mindset instead of that of a losing mindset. And we're able to do that through the tiny habits method. So that's, that's why I'm here. This is my purpose. This is my journey. And Catherine, thank you so much for helping me facilitate that. Oh man, I, I'm just so moved by your story. And I, I think uh, <laughs> I didn't know that story before you told it, you know, and, and, and that is, I, I have so many clients that go through so you know, many heartbreaks and tragedies and traumas and 
dramas and things like that. It's, it's, it's just incredible. So I feel like what you're saying, give it a little on myself, you know, that we all, if you love people and you have families, it's, it's inevitable. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I feel very grateful that you shared that with us because I think that nobody can say, okay, that this is good for everyone, but me. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. So I, I'm kind of just awed, you know, by, by what you just shared. Um, so I feel like from here, it'd be really great to, to maybe dig into some of the actual ways to how do tiny habits work? You know, how, what, it, or what is even a habit? I mean, let's just really start with basics here because yeah, we can see you started with the basics. So it'd be great for us to, to, to start there too. Yes, absolutely. Let's just jump right in. Um, we look at habit formation as a skill. So when we say a skill, it's something that you may not have perfected at first and you may never have it perfected. However, it's not about perfection. It's about progression. So like any skill, learning the key components of the skill and continuing to practice them and implement them into your life is what really is critical. Um, let me start off with um, giving some foundations for understanding how behavior works. What I'd like to do right now is walk you through what's called the Fogg behavior model. This is another model that my, B, my brother BJ Fogg has, has developed and it is becoming an industry standard for behavior designers to really understand how human behavior works. Right. I'd like to share this with your audience because I think it's important once you understand this model, you'll be able to look at your world in a little different way to really understanding why things are happening or why things aren't happening as far as behaviors in yourself, and behaviors in those around you. Okay, are we right. good with that? And yeah, I have very good. Through this on our board, but I will also talk through this for those that are listening to the audio. So you should be able to follow me so much, you know, so much. So the FOB behavior model is basically this. Yeah, I'm going to stand this way because I really can't write that way. Um, <laughs> behavior happens. So the B here in this equation, behavior happens when motivation, ability, and a prompt come together at the same time. Now, you know, together at the same time is really key. So, uh, you know, remember that one, come together at the same time. What we mean by a prompt is a, it's something that's a call to action. Um, BJ used to call this a trigger, but because of the, the negative connotations with the word trigger, we have now moved to prompt, which actually is a, is a more accurate description of what, what this component yes. is. So as we're looking at this, um, I'll call it a formula, but as we're looking at this formula of behavior happens when motivation, ability, and a prompt come together at the same time, there's actually a graph, that, a chart that we can graph out that will help you better understand this. So let's imagine that on this um, vertical axis, we have motivation. And motivation ranges from high to low. Yep. Okay. Let's see, are we? Okay. And on this horizontal axis, we have ability. And ability also ranges from high to low. But instead of saying high ability and low ability, we write something that's easy to do. So if ability is high, it is easy to do. Okay. If ability is low, then something is hard to do. Okay, Great. let's imagine, and I'll show you how, how ability um, and motivation are a trade-off. So let's imagine, we all have the situation, let's imagine that we are sitting at home or maybe you know, we're cooking dinner or something that really isn't demanding a lot of our attention. Mm -hmm. And our phone rings, I mean, this is common to all of us, our phone rings uh, and it, it's signaling us, that's a prompt to answer the phone. Because we're in a situation where it's easy for us to do that behavior, and, you know, if you're like me, you always look to see who's calling. So, you know, that behavior is easy to do. And you might be highly motivated because maybe it's a friend of yours that's calling you. So as a result, when prompted with ability high and motivation high, that behavior will happen. And that's indicated by up here in this space. Okay. Let's take the opposite scenario. Imagine here again, maybe, you know, uh, Catherine, you and I are in this conversation right now. I have my phone turned on silent. However, it's, it vibrates when it rings. So imagine that my phone rings right now while we're talking. I cannot answer it. So I have very low ability because I'm busy. 
I'm doing something else that's more important than answering my phone. <laughs> also, I glance down to see what the caller ID says. And it's, it, it says, you know, unknown caller. I don't know about you, but I'm not really keen on answering calls from unknown callers. Mm -hmm. So not only is it hard for me to do, but I'm not very motivated to answer that mm -hmm. call either. So when prompted with low motivation and the behavior is hard to do, that behavior does not happen. So as we're looking at this model, we can see that there is a very clear trade-off between motivation and ability. And it falls along this line. Um, for our listeners, it, it's just an arbitrary line actually on this, on this graph. But it falls between on this, this slope line, and we call it the action line. So any behavior that falls above the action line, which means it needs to have the right combination of a and motivation and ability when prompted will happen. Any behavior that falls below this action line will not happen. Okay, so that's understanding how behavior works. Um, and like I said, this is an arbitrary line, but what it indicates is that we can manipulate, I say manipulate, I use that in a positive term, terminology right now, that we can manipulate our ability and motivation to get it above the action line so the behaviors that we want to do will happen, or the behaviors that we want our kids to do or our spouses to do will happen. We just have to be aware of you know, what, what, a what happens, what causes the behavior. It's motivation, ability, and a prompt. Now, especially in, Catherine, you, you probably know this, and those of our listeners that are in, an, in the health and wellness industry, they know this too. So often, all we do is focus on motivation. I mean, how often when something hasn't happened, you blame yourself. You say, oh, I just wasn't motivated enough. That's not the case. If you look at why that behavior didn't happen, you will look at, well, what was the prompt? And when the prompt occurred, what was my ability to do that behavior? Could I do that behavior? And of course, you need to have some degree of motivation, but you don't have to have a lot of motivation. Oftentimes, um, health coaches, you know, people in the health industry, focus on amping up motivation. Yes, you do an amp up motivation, but it's not sustainable. It will ebb and flow. If you make things easier to do when that prompt occurs, that's how you can create consistent behaviors and habits. So, as you're looking at this, this model, over here on the far right side where things are easy to do, Brian, over here, it doesn't matter if there's little motivation, you need to have some, but you don't have to have a lot of motivation. But if a behavior is easy to do, no matter where it falls from anywhere from low motivation to high motivation, as long as there's some, when prompted, that behavior will happen. It's not might or maybe it will, it's a given. So there you go, that's the fog behavior model. So we're gonna build off this premise because as far as looking at this space right here where things are really easy to do when prompted, this is where habits reside. This is also where the tiny habits method um, came from. It was born from when DJ looked at this, he goes, oh my goodness, yes, this is what we need to focus on. It's a providing a prompt, a call to action when a behavior is really easy to do. That's, that's fantastic. That really, because I know exactly what you're saying is, is usually it's motivation that we're focusing on. And, yeah. and it's like thinking up of all kinds of crazy schemes to try and get ourselves motivated or get other people motivated, you know, and it's, it's, I, I find what you're saying. It's um, in my experience without really knowing this, this method, I instinctively, I also, I do try to make things super easy for myself because <laughs> I, because I know myself well enough to know that if it's, if it's hard, I just, I cannot be bothered. Exactly. And, you know, I'll, this is one of BJ's uh, gifts, and he, he sees it as a gift. He's able to take complex concepts and processes and break them down into very simple and executable methods of model. Mm -hmm. So, yes, when you see something like this, you'll, you probably think, oh, yeah, I know that. However, it probably hasn't ever been put in this kind of a systematic process where you can actually think through that. Right. Tiny right. habits is much the same way. You know, once you learn the tiny habits method, you go, oh, yeah, that makes so much sense. So. However, BJ has the ability to put it into a system or a process that is execute, you, know, you can execute on it very simply and easily. So. Right. So, All right. Yeah. So what's okay. the next step? What's the next step like? Because um, you were saying habit formation is a skill. Um, so, yes. yeah. So let, let me take you into um, what we call the anatomy of a tiny habit. Okay. So that you understand there are three very distinct components. And uh, so I'm going to share a few slides here. Um, 
this just basically emphasizes that creating habits is a skill. It's a skill that can be learned by somebody that is four years old or somebody that is 100 years old, you know, anywhere in between. It's, it's always a skill that can be practiced, fine-tuned, and revised. So when you're looking at a tiny habit, there's three distinct parts of it. When we call it a recipe, the reason we call it a recipe is like any recipe, you can revise components of that recipe to your liking so that it works for you. The tiny habits method is a very fluid method. It, there's no right or wrong. Um, and part of the process, part of the method with tiny habits is what we call revision. You know, revising it, being able to revise the components of it as needed so it works and you get the results that you want. So the first part of anatomy, uh, the anatomy of a tiny habit is what we call an anchor moment. An anchor moment is an existing routine that you already have. Now, if we refer, you know, think back to the fog behavior model that I just took you to, the anchor moment is the prompt. It's the call to action. So, for example, with my Maui habit, after my feet hit the floor in the morning, that's something, hopefully, that happens every day for me. I mean, so far it has. <laughs> so, you know, so that's an anchor moment that I can attach new behaviors to that's very, very reliable. Another anchor moment that many of us have is brushing our teeth. So that's something that we can use as a prompt to do what the next step is. One of our classic tiny habit recipes is after I brush my teeth, I will floss one tooth. Now, you know, that's a very good recipe because most people do not floss their teeth. Now, why don't they? You know, I don't really know why not. But, you know, the anchor moment after I brush my teeth is a, is a really reliable anchor that you can attach a new behavior to. In fact, um, one of my tiny habits that I designed two years ago here again when I felt, felt myself falling into this deep abyss, abyss of depression, especially as my husband took a really strong turn for the worse, and it, it, I realized that I was going to have to put him in a memory care facility because it was getting beyond my ability to care for him. Here again, I got very, very depressed. Um, and I stopped myself. Because I said, you know what, Linda, you know how to stop this. You know how to create habits and behaviors that can help you overcome this feeling of depression and overwhelm. I mean, a lot of depression comes from feeling overwhelmed. Right. So I designed a tiny habit recipe, and you might laugh at this, but I thought, okay, I need to have positive thoughts, positive feelings throughout my day, consistently throughout my night, day, not just at morning, not just at night. And I thought, okay, what is an anchor moment that I do consistently throughout my day that I can attach a new behavior to? Well. Most of us go to the bathroom about seven times a day. And I drink a ton of water, so it's actually more than that. So the tiny habit anchor that I used for my tiny habit recipe was after I flushed the toilet. because so I knew that would happen periodically throughout my day. The tiny behavior, and this is what we'll get to next, um, the tiny behavior that I put with that was that I will think of one person that has made a difference in my life and be grateful for them. So the tiny habit recipe, as it was, you know, as I designed it, was after I flushed the toilet, I will think of one person that has made a difference in my life that I'm grateful for, and then celebrate that. So what that did is it allowed me to think positively throughout the day. It also allowed me to celebrate, which we're going to talk about in a minute, which when you attach a positive emotion to a new behavior, it releases endorphins and dopamine into your brain, which is our feel-good drug. And we can, we can design for that to happen. And Tiny Habits yeah. allows that. We, and we all need more of those. <laughs> <laughs> right? No kidding? Um, and that's a, you know, this Tiny Habit recipe, my grat this gratitude habit, is one that I still practice today. Um, what ended up happening and what is happening is, you know, I still face really challenging times um, with my kids. Um, you know, my bipolar daughter's been back in and out of the hospital the last six months. My husband's not doing well. So there's still daily challenges and stressors on me. However, by practicing that gratitude habit after I flush the toilet, thinking of one person that you know has made a difference for me, I know that I have a whole team behind me. Now they don't know I'm celebrating them. I mean, I told BJ that, but they don't know that I'm celebrating them on a consistent basis. But the difference that it's made in me is knowing that I can do this. I've got support systems. I got people pulling for me, and that gives me the strength and the wherewithal to push through those challenges. What also happened, which was a, a byproduct that I didn't expect, was my relationship with these people has gotten stronger. It's mm -hmm. gotten better. And maybe it comes just to positive vibes I'm sending them. I don't know. Um, but my relationship with them ha has gotten stronger. So anchor moments, we all have anchor moments in our existing, you know, existing routines in our daily life. They're things that we do habitually. So those are things that we can use you know, as a first right. part of the recipe. The right. second part is the tiny behavior. Now, this is where, this is an area that some people have a hard time understanding. You know, how tiny is tiny enough for a tiny habit recipe? The tiny behavior needs to take 30 seconds or less to complete. 
this is where we say you can create habits without relying on willpower or motivation. Because there's no willpower or motivation needed if your habit is really easy to do. We're increasing the ability by making that habit 30 seconds or less to complete. Now, I probably know what you're thinking, Catherine. It's like, well, what, what if I want to create the habit of running for 30 minutes a day? That's a big behavior. Mm. Now, yes, you can will yourself to do that. You can try to motivate yourself to do that. But as all of us have tried bigger habits, you know, maybe a week, maybe 10 days, we get discouraged and we quit. That's because it hasn't started tiny. One of my weight loss clients, her name is Rebecca. Um, she, you know, she was, um, was not in very good health. And one of her aspirations, we call goals aspirations instead of goals, but one of her aspirations was to be able to walk for 30 minutes every day after dinner. And so I said, okay, that's great, Rebecca. Let's design a tiny habit recipe for that. So as we started looking at what the anchor moment was for her, when she said after dinner, that was very vague. It's not going to act as a prompt. It's not specific. The more specific you get with your anchor moments and your tiny behaviors, the higher the success rate is going to be. So specificity is key. So with Rebecca, I said, okay, what do you do after dinner? And so she walked me through her, her you know, routine, what she did after dinner. And so by her sharing that with me, we identified that her anchor moment was after I start the dishwasher. So that was her prompt. And as far as walking for 30 minutes, the tiny habit that we designed, and this is an approach that we call a starter step, was after I press the start, the start button on my dishwasher, I will put on my walking shoes and celebrate. Now you might say, well, she's not walking. I say, yeah, I know, I know she's not walking. However, she is planting that little tiny seed, the seed I referred to earlier, in our conversation she's starting to plant that seed of that habit she's putting on her walking shoes and celebrating and i told her if you want to walk after that go ahead you can but the tiny habit the tiny behavior that you're celebrating your tiny habit recipe is just putting on your walking shoes mm. and she was at first was confused she said, you mean i don't need to walk I said, oh, no you don't need to walk if you want to you can now here again is an interesting approach to human psychology um just because well as a result of allowing her giving her permission to do less and be successful and celebrate that, she ended up doing more, much more quickly than she would have had I taken the other approach. So within 10 days, she was walking consistently 30 minutes after dinner. Okay, so, I wanna go back, I wanna go over that again, cause that's a very, very interesting, um, one of those behavioral science things that, that kind of totally blows your mind. So you're saying, let's see if I understand this, you're saying that by actually giving her permission to it's by setting the bar very low, basically, she just put her walking shoes on, time up, yay, like big, you know, hooray. And, and then, but what that does is that actually frees her up. Well, well, now I've got my shoes on, I can go walking if I want. And, and, and yeah, so tell me more about yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, yes. Um, what that does is when your client or when you decide to do more, Mm -hmm. you, feel like you feel like you're overachieving, which is good. And you know, yeah, you can celebrate that too. But what mm. the intent of that tiny behavior is, is to plant that tiny habit in that time of your day. Of course, you need to make sure that, you know, you have time to walk for 30 minutes if you're going to start that tiny habit at that point in time. And right. you, can, you can walk for 30 minutes anytime you want to. But the tiny behavior and the tiny habit recipe that you're practicing is after I start the dishwasher, I'll put on my walking shoes. And that's what you celebrate. Now, maybe one day you, you can go walk for 30 minutes. Maybe the next day you don't feel like it. That's okay. You're still keeping that habit alive by just putting on your walking shoes and celebrating. You're, keep, you know, you're starting to create that as an automatic behavior. And that's how we define habit. It's something that happens automatically. Right. Back to define that, um, I'm going to have you do something real quick, Catherine, and all okay. your uh, viewers and listeners as well. What okay. I want you to do is fold your arms. Just fold your arms like you normally do. Okay. Now look down. Notice which arm is on top. Okay. okay. Unfold your arms and fold it the opposite way. <laughs> you had to think about that, right? Yeah, definitely. Because even the way you fold your arms is a habit. Mm. We have so many automatic behaviors in our life that we don't realize are habits. And this is the approach that we're taking with the tiny habits method. We're creating, putting on, like with Rebecca, putting on her walking shoes to be an automatic behavior after she starts the dishwasher. Right. And what also happens by celebrating that is they start feeling what we call success momentum. Mm. Now, success momentum is what pushes us through to achieve, you know, breakthroughs because uh, we're feeling good about ourselves. In fact, our studies with the five-day tiny habits program that we do, 
shows that even in just five days, in five days or less, you can create a habit using the tiny habits method. Also in that period of time, you can change your identity. You can change how you see yourself simply because you're achieving these little tiny habits and behaviors and you're being successful. And as a result, you're starting to feel successful. You now see yourself as a person who can create change. You now see yourself as a person who can, you know, design the lifestyle that you want. You now see yourself, you know, so you start seeing yourself in a different light. That is huge when it comes to behavior change. Because oftentimes, and we all have these negative voices in our head. Oftentimes, we give them too much time on our stage of our life. We listen to them too strongly. So what the celebration does, and that's the next part of the Tiny Habits Method, is an instant celebration. What the celebration does is it helps change your mindset. It helps reinforce the changes that you're trying to make. It also helps you feel successful. Um, in fact, I'm going to jump down here. Um, and this, and when I say it helps you feel successful, oftentimes when we're creating new habits and behaviors, we're focused on being successful. And oftentimes our coaches are helping you be successful. What we are emphasizing with the tiny habits method is to help you feel successful. Now that's just one change of one word, but yet it's a huge change. Feeling successful will help you in turn be successful. So if you feel successful, you will be successful. However, if you're only focusing on feeling sick or being successful, you're checking the boxes and I'm not against tracking, but you've got to recognize that, you know, even if you're tracking some habits and behaviors and you do them for five days, well, the first day that you, it doesn't happen for whatever reason, it doesn't really matter why, what do we focus on? We focus yeah, on yeah. that one day that it didn't happen. Yeah. And then those negative voices creep up, oh, this doesn't work either, or I'm a failure, I can't do this. Um, and so we're not feeling successful. So just realize that our lives change, our situations change, our environments change, and that's going to impact our behavior. So be okay with that. Be kind to yourself um, and just realize that, you know, maybe one day all Rebecca could do is just put it on her walking shoes and celebrate. She's feeling successful because that's all that tiny habit is. That's all that she needed to do. Does that make sense? It totally makes sense. And I think it's really important. Um, this part is just so, so important because I find that the reason why most of us don't attempt sometimes to do di different things is because we've quote failed so many times you know we've tried something we've set off with the best motivation and and we do run that half hour or we do go to the gym at 6 30 every morning three times a week or you know it's it's like and then and then the the thing that i find so interesting is that is then uh we stop at some point and we sometimes we go oh my god i was doing that for six months straight and then something happened like you know like you said your your daughter goes into the hospital or you know some some other thing happens and um so what i found because i you know after uh connecting with you and and get diving more deeply into this method i realized that for for instance i want to learn spanish and so but i feel terrible because i've dropped it completely i was going strong for months and then i dropped it and then i feel terrible so now whenever i think of practicing I'm like it brings up that terrible emotion for me like oh I I've failed and yeah, gosh it's going to be so hard to get started again and you know all these different ideas so I did what you said and it's just like well at a certain point in my day I will open up the Duolingo app on my phone and I thought really just open it up <laughs> yeah but the thing is that's amazing about it is is I I forgot to do, I was actually traveling. I forgot to do it the first few times. And, but then I realized, but I'm thinking about it. I, I kind of forgot, but I didn't really forget. Like I, I remembered I forgot. And so then I, so then I started doing it. And then I, last week I studied like 10 times more than I did the week before. And again, it wasn't perfect, but it, it's just like that building on that one tiny um, thing and I started to actually think oh like you said I could see my mindset changing like I wasn't focusing on the fact that I dropped the ball or that I, I was focusing on oh look I I did it yay you know <laughs> so that's yeah. just a personal experience because I, I think you know when you tell people just lost one tooth they're like oh my god that's never gonna but when you look at the behavioral science behind it that's when you start to realize yeah exactly 
fact, oftentimes people will ask me, well, floss one tooth, why should I even do that? It's like, well, are you flossing any teeth right now? <laughs> they chose it, you know, that's the recipe they, they want to do. It's like, no, I said, okay, all you need to do is floss one tooth, celebrate that. If you want to go ahead and floss more, yes, absolutely, go ahead and do that. And also celebrate that too, but that's not the tiny habit, it's just flossing one tooth. And what we find is it was in a matter of days that becomes an automatic behavior. Simply because here again comes in the success momentum, the celebration. Um, there's a real key phrase that BJ has coined. And if your listeners or viewers have something to write down, you know, sort of take notes with, write this phrase down. Mm -hmm. And this phrase is, emotions create habits. I'll say that again. Emotions create habits. And this is where the instant celebration part of the tiny habits method helps you attach those positive emotions to the behaviors and habits that you want to repeat and to, and to instigate into your life. So, you know, that there have been a number of people that have more or less knocked off BJ's method, but the one piece they always miss is the importance of the celebration, the instant celebration, attaching a positive emotion to behaviors that you want to repeat. But let's talk about that a minute because celebrating yeah. is hard. And celebrating as women, we don't celebrate ourselves. We celebrate our kids, we celebrate our friends, we celebrate our spouses, but why don't we celebrate ourselves? We need to change that. And the tiny habits method helps you start understanding how we can celebrate ourselves and how to do that. Now, when I say an instant celebration, mm -hmm. and just to go back and review the, the tiny habit recipe method, you'll, uh, now that we've talked about all three parts of the anatomy, mm -hmm. you'll see that the anchor moment is attached to the new tiny behavior. It acts as a prompt. The tiny behavior is really small and easy to do. Our ability is increased. So we're not replying on willpower or motivation. And then the third part is the instant celebration that's attached to that tiny behavior. That's where emotions come in to create habits. Um, now, when I work with women, oftentimes they'll say, well, I don't want to celebrate or I feel weird celebrating or I feel awkward celebrating. I need to give them permission to celebrate. And what I say by permission is it's not optional. This is something that actually is, in my opinion, the nuts and bolts of the tiny habits method is learning how to celebrate. Here again, this helps you feel that success momentum. Yeah. In my Maui habit, I found that it really helped me face my day with positivity, that learning how to celebrate, release those positive emotions. Um, now, let me clearly define the difference between celebration and rewards. Rewards are a delayed gratification. It's something that we earn. And we're not against rewards, but rewards do not create habits. It's the instant attachment of a positive emotion that creates habits. So there is a difference there. This um, is an important, this is important, I think, because even in my work and when I've done challenges and things, I've asked people to choose a reward for when they get done with the challenge. And I thought this, this, this is a very, very important distinction that you're making. Um, so I know I, I, I want, I want you to keep going with that. Just maybe you could just give us like, what was your celebration after you did your, um, after I flushed the toilet, I will think of someone who's affected my life. What was the celebration after that? You know, I tend to get lazy, so I find a celebration that helps me feel good, and I just stick to that one celebration. Yeah. And my celebration is a two thumbs up and, a, and just saying in my mind, yes, or way to go, or yes, you did it. Um, you know, so it's a physical two thumbs up, and silently, I used to say that out loud, um, but, you know, if people around it might be weird. My kids all know that, I mean, we all celebrate in my house now. Anyway, we celebrate yeah. everything. In fact, my youngest daughter a few years ago, I, I came home from something and there was dishes in the sink and I was complaining about how messy the kitchen was and why didn't anybody ever do the dishes? You know, mm -hmm. normal stuff. And my youngest daughter, her name is Summer, she looked at me, she says, mom, maybe we need to do them and celebrate. <laughs> 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 so she understood, you know, she, yeah. she was sort of giving it back to me. Sure. Of, you, know, you know, we all goof, goof around with each other in my family, but yet yes. it helped me realize that she understands that concept. Mm -hmm. Children understand the concept of celebrating much more than adults do because we tend to grow out of feeling comfortable with that. So when I say an instant celebration, it can be anything that makes you feel good. For me, it's a two thumbs up and you know, saying some kind of a, a reinforcing phrase in my head. Um, it could be a pat on the back. It could be a cheer. It could be even just closing your eyes, imagining crowds whirring. Um, or it could be something as simple as one of the celebrations that BJ uses that I just love is what he, he, he recalled back to when he was a third grader. And his favorite teacher, her, her name is Mrs. Bondietti, she would walk by his desk while he was doing his work and she would just say, good job, BJ, and then continue to walk on. Just reflecting on when Mrs. Bondietti, you know, hearing Mrs. Bondietti's head, voice in his head saying, good job, BJ, that helped him 
celebrate. That was a celebration that made him feel good. Mm. And so um, we do have an exercise that I teach my coaches that we also have our coaches teach our, their clients. I'm, I'm gonna, it's a real quick exercise. It's one okay. that I think is going to really be helpful for your audience to learn how to celebrate and understand the impact of celebration. Okay. Um, celebration, like I said, can be anything. In fact, I do have a sheet here that um, you, you're going to have access to, to share with your audience. Okay. But it's, it's a PDF that I've created about 102 tiny habit celebrations. But as you can see here, it can be anything from fist pump or saying yes or saying you did it, or it can be anything, any activity, any thought, anything that makes you feel positive and feel good. Uh, but the exercise that I want your audience to practice goes like this. We call it a celebration blitz. So set a timer on your phone for three minutes. Whatever room you're in, doesn't matter if you're at work, at your office, at home, wherever, go around that room. As soon as that stop timer st starts ticking down, go around that room as quickly as you can, pick up something, put it in place, good job. Pick up something and go, way to go. Pick up something and go, like, oh. so, whatever. I love it. So, so as fast as you can during that three minute time slot, put things in their place and every time do some kind of a celebration. Do some, so it might take you a few times practicing this before you really get it down. But after that timer goes off, mm -hmm. I want you just to stop and reflect. How do you feel? I'll tell you how you probably will feel, how people report back to us what they feel. They feel energized. They feel happy. They feel positive. Because what they've done is they've just released endorphins and dopamine into their brains. Um, this is an exercise. I do a celebration blitz about three o'clock every day because I start to drag and I start to slow down later in my day. And I know all I need to take, do is take three minutes. You know, the benefits are I get, get my area cleaned up. But the real benefit is it gives me the energy and the strength to push through the rest of my day and complete the tasks that I need to complete in a very effective and efficient manner as opposed to dragging them out. Um, so try this, especially if, if you have kids. Try this with kids. It works beautifully with kids. We had a Tiny Habits for Moms program three years ago. I think we'll, we probably will offer that again next summer. Um, but in this program, we had moms work with their kids and doing celebration blitzes. I mean, with my kids, it was always a struggle for them to pick up their toys, clean up their rooms, you name it. And so what these moms did with their kids, and of course, teenage kids are going to look at you like you're an idiot or like you have horns, whatever. But younger kids, I mean, teenage kids get it too, but they just want to tell you they do. Yeah. But with younger kids, what moms would do is they'd do a celebration blitz with their child. They'd say, okay, we're going to start a timer. Every time we pick up something and put it away, we're going to high five. We're going to cheer. We're going to, you know, and, you know, they look at it as sort of a game. And they'd say, okay, ready, go. Well, one of the moms reported back to us that when the timer went off and her child was six years old, when her timer went off, her six-year-old did not want to stop. Right. And then he says, mom, I've never felt so good. So this is, celebration is also a skill. We look at habit formation as a skill. Um, during our certification training, we teach over 38 different skills for our coaches to teach their clients. Celebration is another one of those skills because it's something that you need to learn to do and be, be comfortable with. Some yeah. people are comfortable celebrating. BJ is. For me, it took me a while to really get comfortable with that. However, just learning that skill has really helped me change my perspective on my life. Yeah, so, that's fantastic. I'm just thinking my, my, my six-year-old grandson is going to benefit from this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it really is fun. Um, okay, so just a quick review of the Tiny yes. Habits Method. Great. Um, so let's see. I want to share with you um, what we call a, a recipe card, but you don't have to have a card. But this will really clearly uh, define, help you really see the systematic process in, a in creating a tiny habit. So right. um, as the, the method is after I, and you fill in the blank with an anchor moment, which is an existing routine in your daily life, something that's already a habit. That's great. Um, another note, which probably is not surprising, new habits that you're trying to create in the morning are more effective than habits later in the day. And of course, okay. the reason why is our days go off the track sometimes without the things that we don't control. Yeah. So if as you're learning the skill of habit formation, if you can do habits earlier in the day to help you learn the skill, then that's going to be better. Okay. The tiny behavior, you know, after I, then the tiny behavior is the 30 seconds or less to complete behavior. Now, like, you know, the Maui habit, after I say it's going to be a great day, that behavior is always going to stay that tiny. It's never going to grow. But flossing one tooth, that behavior is going to grow just a little bit and let it grow organically and naturally. It will. Mm -hmm. um, something such as, um, you know, working out, 
going to the gym and working out, that's also a bigger behavior. But if you mm-hmm. approach it with either a starter step, you know, a, some, a tiny behavior that gets you ready to do the bigger behavior or a tiny version, a little tiny part of mm-hmm. doing that bigger behavior, celebrate that and then allow it to grow organically. It will grow organically pretty quickly. And of course, the last part of the tiny habits method, the anatomy is this instant celebration. Mm-hmm. You know, attaching a positive feeling to that behavior. Right. Um, even so, I have, I have, I have beautiful grandchildren. Of course, you know, those of us that have grandchildren, all our, we, we, you know, our grandchildren are always <laughs> the highlight of our lives next to our own kids or maybe even prior to your own kids. But um, I have an adorable granddaughter and I have a picture of her on my cell phone. And that's one of my celebrations. I always have my cell phone with me. And one of my celebrations is just turning on my phone and looking at a picture of Eloise because it makes me feel good. It makes me attach a positive emotion to the behavior that I am trying to create as a habit. So, right. you know, it can be anything that makes you feel good. Yeah. Um, so let's dive into a couple of questions that you might have. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I, I wanted to remind everyone because this is when you were going over that tiny habits recipe um, and that celebration, like wiring that to an emotion, um, that emotions create behaviors, not motivation or discipline or willpower. And I think this is, I just know this is where we just beat ourselves up so badly. It's like, oh my God, I'm such a lazy slob. I can't get disciplined enough. Oh, I'm, I'm so undis, you know, I, I have no willpower. What's going on, you know? And, and yeah. there's just so many, I'm not motivated. I'm what, why am I not inspired to, to help myself? Especially if you have illnesses or things that you're dealing with and, yeah. and you're like, why can't I just get myself to eat better? There's all these kind of different um, ways that we create a situation that we don't want to touch because we, because it just feels so bad. Yeah. Um, so, and, yeah. And, and Catherine, I love what you just said. It's like, why can't I get myself to eat better? That's, mm-hmm. you know, some people will call that as a goal. Goal is a very ambiguous word. We call it an aspiration, an aspiration of learning how to mm. eat and help your habits, eating habits. Mm-hmm. So that by itself, you're not going to be able to achieve because it's not specific. Um, we have a method called um, swarm of bees. So what are all the possible behaviors that you could do in order to help you achieve that aspiration, eating better. Right. It might be, you know, uh, after, I, and this is one of the habits that I do. After I walk into the grocery store, I'll start in the produce section, mm-hmm. celebrate. Something as simple as that. Mm-hmm. Um, after I open up the fridge, I'll throw away one item of food that's not healthy for me. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you've got to break it down into those little tiny actionable steps that cumulatively add up to eating better, you know, healthier eating habits. That's fantastic. That's really good. Um, so you've, like if you don't have many routines in your life, for example, like what would, what, yeah, how would you, how would you do this? Yeah, I love this question. Oftentimes we don't think our life's very routinized or if we have kids, you know, our, our life is not our own, as you know, you know, the, the, <laughs> the, the little control what we do and dictate what we do. However, we do have routines and what it comes down to is just being able to be aware of them and to watching for them. There's an exercise that I also, uh, have my clients and have my, teach my coaches to use with their clients. And it's an exercise very similar to writing a, a, a food log. I'm sure that everybody listening has at some point in their life written down everything that they've eaten in, in a day, a food log. You take that same approach and apply it to existing routines. So from the time you get up to the time you go to bed, write down everything that you do doing them during that day. And then maybe circle the ones that you do consistently every day. Those are anchor moments that you can use. You, we do have many more existing routines than we think that we do if we learn how to watch for them and start being aware of them. In fact, my daughter, my oldest daughter, who has, she's expecting her sixth child. Um, she's also a personal trainer, a fitness competitor. Um, not right now while she's expecting her baby, but she has been. She uses, she's one of our tiny habits coaches as well. Um, but she gets through eight to 10 books a month. Yeah. Wow. But the, how she does it, she has a tiny habit of after I put the key in the ignition of my car, I will push play on my audiobook. Tiny, tiny behavior, but what it ends up in resulting, and she drives a lot during the day because of her kids, she ends up getting through a lot of material. Yeah, she doesn't necessarily read them, but yet she's able to, to consume a lot of helpful material that's good for her and her, you know, her occupation or her as a parent. 
as simple as after I put the key in the ignition, I'll push play on my audiobook and celebrate. That's her tiny habit. So see, we can find these pockets of our days where we can plant these seeds that actually end up making a huge impact on our lives. Mm. There's also a lot of flexibility in that too, because if you're like, oh my God, I, I have this goal to read even one book a month and you're like, yeah. and, but if you're not thinking about the fact that you could be listening to that while you're in your car and you could be listening to it in, you know, even 10 minute increments or something, yeah. you know, that's, so there's certain flexibility in thinking. I love that. I love what you said to write down our routines for the day. Um, one of the questions that I had was, so, cause sometimes I'd be thinking about the anchor, the, the tiny habits recipe and I'd be thinking, well, before I go to bed, I'll do this, but you're always saying after. So how, how does that work? Yes. I love this question too. I, I mean, I, these questions are great questions because there's questions that your audience are, are asking as well. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes people will think, okay, before I go to bed, I want we'll to do reading again. Before I go to bed, I want to read a chapter in a book or before I go to bed, I want to read 10 pages. Um, what you're doing is you're identifying that time of day that you want that behavior to happen. So if you take a few steps back, you can find an anchor moment that the behavior could come after. The reason that's important is as, you know, if you'll recall, the anchor moment acts as a prompt. Mm. Now, if the anchor moment is designed to occur after the tiny behavior, it's not a prompt anymore. So like with my clients that have, you know, wanted to design rest, and it's fine saying before, but just notice what that's really doing is identifying the time of day that you want that behavior to happen. So take a few steps back and look at your existing routines before that time period. Um, for example, if a client said, I want to read 10 pages before I go to bed, I say, okay, tell me what you do before you go to bed. And, you know, so once they start thinking about it, immediately, they might not be able to tell me, but they'll start paying attention. Okay, what do I do before I go to bed? And it uh, might be, they might say, well, I put on my, you know, I brush my teeth, I put on my pajamas, or, you know, whatever order they do it in. Um, you know, I say my prayers, maybe, you know, I kneel down and say my prayers before I, I get into bed. It's like, great, let's use that as your anchor moment. After I say my prayers, I will pick up the book on my nightstand and celebrate. <laughs> and it is not say read 10 pages, but what typically will happen is they feel successful at just doing that tiny behavior. And if indeed they want to read those 10 pages, that eventually will happen consistently. That's, that's very cool. I had this, just to give an example, I had a Thing. I, I like to write, write just a little bit in a, in a journal. And so I had it as, okay, I, after I wake up in the morning, I will write in my journal. Um, but I was, it wasn't working. And I realized it was because I didn't, so I created another tiny habit. I said, when, after I go to bed at night, I will make sure my journal is on the nightstand on my, because Perfect. sometimes I move things around and I'll make yeah. sure it's there. So then when I wake up in the morning, I literally look over and it's sitting there. And then I have a, when I wake up in the morning, I will, you know, so now since I've been doing that, it's like, great. I, I, I actually feel this sense of, oh, I, I really want to do this now. Um, Cause I've Perfect. already succeeded at putting it there for the night before. Yeah. And it's, it's just, it's de just changed something, a very tiny little thing. It's not, like some huge, big habit changed, but it's actually become a positive thing in my life. Whereas before I was like, Oh, I forgot again. <laughs> yeah. We have so many opportunities to beat ourselves up. You know, creating yeah. habits shouldn't be one of those. Yes. So I, right. lo I love how you revise that behavior and that habit. And what you did probably without realizing it, but what you did is you changed your context. You set yourself up for success by putting your journal, you know, creating that as one of your habits, putting it on your nightstand. Um, like with Rebecca, I had her actually move her tennis shoes to underneath her kitchen desk. She had a desk in her kitchen. Yeah. So after she started the dishwasher, she didn't have to go to a room to look at them because she would have gotten sidetracked. Yeah. So this, this is one of the concepts that we teach in the certifications, how to find the right anchor moment to put with a tiny behavior. You know, we call that pairing. And yeah. one of the things is, you know, a location, that the location needs to be, you know, the, of the anchor moment needs to be in the same place as the tiny behavior. So without even knowing that, Catherine, that's what you did. You created that that's habit. Cool. That the location would work for you. Yeah, yeah. yeah like I said, a lot of this is intuitive. Mm -hmm. um, or a lot of it, you go, oh, yeah, I think I knew this. But BJ has such a great way of putting it into a systematic process that it's doable. Um, so. Yes, I, 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 it's just amazing. So I, uh, this thing about making it easy is primary, too. You know, like if, yeah. if because like you said, if you, if you have to go into a different room to get something and then you go into that room and there's a million things in there that are, you're seeing 
that, and I, mm -hmm. I think the visual cues are, are, mm -hmm. are so important. Um, exactly. I agree. <laughs> So yeah, in fact, one of my, yeah. one, make it easy. One of my yeah, tiny habits, yeah. and when, a couple of tips that we have, when you start practicing tiny habits, we suggest that you do a tiny habit that happens daily. Why? Because that gives you more opportunity to practice it. You are able to learn more quickly. Also, you will probably need to revise a few of your tiny habit recipes. That's normal. And we want you to be able to do that. So that gives you that experience much more quickly as opposed to one time a week habit. Right. Now, that being said, you can use tiny habits for once a week. I love houseplants. I used to buy house plants and I forget to water them for you know weeks on end and of course then they die and my husband will always accuse me of you know being a, a you know killing house plants they would never let me into the plant store again or whatever yeah um, and then as I started learning tiny habits and teaching it to others it's like okay I can create a tiny habit recipe to help me create the habit of watering my house plants mm. so I looked at my week and I knew I, could, I thought okay I don't want to water my plants daily because then I'll drown them instead of starving them um, I wanted to water them once a week mm. So I thought, okay, what existing routine do I do on a weekly basis? And I go to church every Sunday. So I realized that the anchor moment that I could use for that was after I walk in the door after church, I will pick up my closest plant. Mm. So picking it up, I take it in the kitchen and water it. Well, once I got that one watered, I would, you know, either fill a pitcher or I'd systematically water all of my plants. I've not killed a plant now for three years. <laughs> um, yeah, I had to really think through, okay, what, what is it that I want to accomplish? When does it need to occur? And what anchor moment can I use? I even moved a plant closer to my front door. Like you said, the visual, the visual yeah. reminder as well. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I pick up that plant even now. I walk in the door after church. I pick up the plant and go, good job. You're doing it. Or way to go. Mm -hmm. You know? So that's how I've been able to establish a once a week habit of keeping my plants alive. I'm actually pretty proud of myself. <laughs> <laughs> that's very good. That's, I, I'm very proud of you too. <laughs> Very happy for those plants. The one behind you looks in pretty good shape. So that's proof. <laughs> <laughs> so I think maybe one more question. I know there's tons of questions. And what I would really um, encourage all of you watching to do is, is be on the Facebook group, post comments and questions there. Um, stuff that I can't answer, I'll ask Linda and we'll get her on the group too if she can. And Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So we'll just... Um, and there'll be a link to that group below and uh, also a, um, a link to um, a couple of those slides so that you can kind of right. look at those if you want to. Um, but I want to know how many tiny habits can someone do at once? When, when you start learning the skill of habit formation, we suggest that you start with three. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a reason, not one, because if one doesn't work, then here again, you're reinforcing the fact that you're failing, you're a failure, you can't do it. Yeah. If you do three, typically what happens is one of those works really well, one of those doesn't work so well, which is good because you can revise it, and then the third one falls somewhere in between. Plus, yeah. if you're practicing three, you learn the skill much more quickly. Now, yeah. once you've learned the skill of habit formation, you can add new tiny habits as soon as you're ready. You know, you might be able to add tiny habits right away, um, or it may, you know, you might want to make sure those are solid before you add more. There really isn't a yeah. rhyme or reason. What we don't, I, I had one client that said, oh, I want to add a new tiny habit every day. So she started off with Monday, on Monday with three, Tuesday she had a new one, Wednesday she had a new one, and finally on, and I said, I don't know if that's going to work very well, but you can try it. Finally on Thursday she said, oh yeah, you're right. I, it, you know, once it starts stressing you or taking willpower mm -hmm. or motivation, then, then that's not the method. Um, yeah. So now, you know, I've been practicing tiny habits now for nearly six years. Um, next to BJ, I, I'm very comfortable saying, you know, I, I know about tiny habits more than anybody else next to BJ. He's, you know, he's yeah. the master in this. Um, what I have found is the most new habits that I can practice at once are seven. For me, right. I get more than seven. And when I say new, it's habits I haven't done before. Yeah. I get more than seven, then it does take a lot of focus and willpower. And that's yeah. not the method. So now, what happens though is I have a whole, you know, my routines consist of tiny habits that have grown into the type of routines and lifestyle that I want to have in my life. And I also realize that habits are seasonal many times. So there, you might have a habit for a month. It might be for the summer. It might be for a short period of time. So don't beat yourself up if you, know, you stop doing a habit and go, wow, I haven't done that habit for a while. Reflect and say, okay, did it serve the purpose that it was intended to serve during the time that you're practicing it? Yeah. So, you know, Give yourself some grace and some kindness and some latitude. Yes. This is yes. really a fun process. You know, approach changing life, 
your life and creating new habits and behaviors in a playful manner. Um, Sounds great. It sounds really great. And one of the things that I wanted to clarify, because if you're watching this a couple weeks before the summit starts, you're going to have time to practice this. If you're just getting started watching this, you know, and, and the summit's about to start, you're going to have three speakers every week and each of those speakers is going to give you a lot of information that's going to be very cool, but we're going to distill that down to a tiny habit. We're going to help you as much as we can with that on the worksheet we're going to send you. So my um, suggestion is that you start a tiny ha some tiny habits of your own. And then when you get to that first week, just choose, I would just recommend just choose one, maybe two at the most, you know, like really decide which one is going to serve you best. And some of this weeks, there's going to be an advanced step. So it's one that takes more. So you're, it's going to take a little longer to put into motion. And again, we'll help you with that. I, I, I will, you know, make sure that you have lots of options, basically. But by the time you get to the end of this, technically, you could have six tiny habits that you've put in motion. Some of those you'll already be done with. And you can circle back and mm -hmm. try other ones. So, um, exactly. but yeah, but the, the whole idea is of spreading the summit over six weeks is to make sure that you actually have time to practice so that you don't just feel overwhelmed and feel like, oh my God, I, I failed. You're going to find some that are easier, some that are harder, just like uh, Linda said, and, and, and then you'll be, be able to learn from all of it. Yeah. And Catherine, if I can make a recommendation for your listeners yes. right now, start today. Yes. Um, I'm going to recommend, we don't typically prescribe tiny habit recipes because you, we want you to design recipes that you want to create. However, when we work with corporations and we're working with groups, we do prescribe three specific tiny habit recipes for them to start using. Okay. And so maybe now, between now and when they get into the con, other content, um, you can play with some of these tiny habit recipes. Right. Of course, by no surprise, the first one that I always recommend to my clients is the Maui habit. Yes. After my feet hit the floor in the morning, I'll say it's going to be a great day. I mean, who couldn't benefit from that? Yeah. The second one is if you don't brush your teeth, do the flossing one tooth habit. After I brush my teeth, I'll floss one tooth. Mm. If you do floss your teeth, then do a different habit. Um, the anchor moment could be after I turn on the shower, I will, it could be anything. I will do two push ups or you know, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. um, so one of those two you can choose depending on whether or not you floss your teeth. The okay. third habit that we recommend, I recommend, is the gratitude habit. There's so much, gratitude mm -hmm. is such an important characteristic and skill that. We need to have more of in our daily lives because it really changes our lives in a, in a great way. So the third habit that I always recommend is after my head hits the pillow at night, I will think of one thing that I'm grateful for. And if you forget those, don't worry, but just, you know, start playing yes, around. With start playing. Habits. Yeah, and be sure and celebrate. That's key. Celebrate. I love that. I love that. I love every, I mean, I, I, obviously, um, I'm a fan, so. Uh, <laughs> but I do feel like this is a very, um, this is a core issue and that for, for women to be able to, you know, optimize their health, their energy, their vitality, we need more women active in the world. We need more women visible and doing things out there. And if we're held back by our, you know, low energy or a lack of health or well-being or, you know, our brains aren't working as well as they used to be, this is holding us back. And, and so I feel this what you've just gone over is like a, handing everyone a key to being successful in a way that they may not have experienced before in terms of making some of these changes. Because not only are you going to be successful creating a new habit, you're going to get the results from changing that habit. And that's the whole purpose behind this. So, so and the secret byproduct yeah. is a change of mindset. Yes. Yeah. Change of mindset, and I and I can vouch for that. I feel that in the the few little tiny habits I put into place. So, um, I just wanna I want to thank you. We're gonna have um, one of the things that I'd advise people to do, um, especially since Linda has been so generous with her time, and and uh, there is a new book coming out called Tiny Habits. I forget that. What's the tagline on that? Oh, you know, and of course, now that you ask me, I'm looking for, I, I, um, I have the edit copy. Oh, it's okay. Um, tiny, tiny habits, small changes that end, uh, result in big results. Or yes. Lead to bigger and, changes. I, you know what? Yes. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. <sighs> yes. No worries. Tiny habits. <laughs> yes. Small, ham, small habits lead to bigger changes. And this yeah. is what the small changes. That, that, 
the, the second tagline, we went back and forth on exactly what it should be. And of course, you know, as BJ yeah. authored it, you know, I, I've helped him with it. I'm throughout my story throughout his book as well. Sure. Um, yeah. Look for the tiny habits book, the small changes that lead to big results. Is what the, what the, what the time. Yeah. And, and that's on, available for pre-order. <laughs> it's available for pre-order. We'll have a link. We're going to have a link below because there's, yeah. if you use this link, you'll get certain bonuses when you, when you pre-order from this yeah. link. Um, we're also going to have a link to a PDF. So there's a lot of different ways you can celebrate. And because that is, is, I think, one of the hardest parts of this. And it's so, so important to base your habit change in emotion and not discipline. And, and then we'll, we'll see. We'll probably have a few other things there for you. But look below this video for all of that. And um, I just want to thank you all for getting started on this summit. I'm, I'm very excited about what we can achieve. And I look forward to being on this adventure with you. And thank you so much, Linda, for being here today. I really, really have appreciated your, your insights and your life experience as well. Thank you so much, Catherine. All right. I'll say bye for now.